Good morning and welcome to this, the third and final day, but the best day <coughs> of the Federalist Society National Lawyers Convention. I'm Dean Reuter and welcome. Thank you all for being here this morning. Today we have on tap from the uh, judges from the District Court, or from the, I'm sorry, from the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, the Third, the Fifth, and the Tenth Circuit Courts of Appeals. And we'll have professors from Amherst and from Brown, law schools including Columbia, Stanford, and North Carolina, two commissioners from the FCC, and one from the FTC. And then later, I understand we're going to have somebody from the Supreme Court stopping by to deliver an address and answer your questions. And we're going to have much, much more than that. So thank you all for being here. To begin our day this morning, we've got a showcase panel on the religion clauses moderated by a gentleman I have fairly recently gotten to know. On the recommendation of my good friend Jerry Walpin, who's known to many of you, earlier this year I sat down to lunch with Federal District Court Judge William Kuntz in New York City. It's been my distinct pleasure since then, since that moment, to get to know him better. Now for your edification, Judge Kuntz has an AB from Harvard, and Judge Kuntz has a JD from Harvard as well. Judge Kuntz has a master's degree from Harvard, <laughs> and Judge Kuntz has a PhD from Harvard. <laughs> now we had lunch in New York City at the Harvard Club. <laughs> <clears throat> and they seemed to know him there, they recognized him. <laughs> but in seriousness, I was very happy to meet him. I'm happy today to welcome him here to what I think is his first Federalist Society convention, certainly as a moderator. So without further, Judge Kuntz. Thank you. Thank you, Dean, for that very warm introduction. My late father-in-law, who was a Yale man, wondered if I was ever going to get a job. Um, but I did. I practiced law for 33 years, commercial litigation in New York. Um, I'm a district court judge in the Eastern District of New York, and I typically begin remarks such as this by saying, someone who is unknown to you and is in desperate need of an introduction is going to introduce you to people who are very well known to you and need no introduction. So that is my role. Um, but as a district court judge, I'm used to uh, standing up and uh, telling people that, of course, I sound a little like James L. Jones, but I look exactly, I look exactly like Denzel Washington. So there's not. <laughs> they don't laugh in my courtroom when I say that. <laughs> Today we are going to discuss with this outstanding panel what many regard as among the most significant issues in American legal and constitutional history, the tension between the Establishment Clause and the Free Expression Clause of our First Amendment. Now on January 11th of this year, Chief Justice Roberts delivered the opinion of the United States Supreme Court in the Hosanna-Tabor decision. He framed the central issue our panel will discuss today as follows. The First Amendment provides in part that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We have said that these two clauses often exert conflicting pressures and that there can be internal tension tension between the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. Not so here. Both religion clauses bar the government from interfering with the decision of a religious group to fire one of its ministers. Today we explore that internal tension between the Establishment Clause and the Free Expression Clause with a panel of experts whose knowledge of this fundamental element of our constitutional heritage is truly second to none. Professor Corey L. Brettschneider. He is of Brown University. Professor Philip Andrew Hamburger, who is the Maurice and Hilda Friedman Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. Professor William P. Marshall of the University of North Carolina Law School. And the Honorable Michael W. McConnell the Richard and Francis Mallory Professor of Law at the Stanford Constitutional Law Center, who served with great distinction 
as a judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. You have more extensive biographies of each of them in your printed materials, and I will not delay the proceedings any further by reading those biographies. Now, as the Chief Justice noted, it was against this background of an official Church of England that the First Amendment was adopted. Familiar with life under the established Church of England, the founding generation sought to foreclose the possibility of a national church. He noted that the establishment clause addresses the fear that one sect might obtain a preeminence or two combine together and establish a religion to which they would compel others to conform, citing the remarks of Madison himself. By forbidding the establishment of religion and guaranteeing the free exercise thereof, the religion clause ensured that the new federal government, unlike the English crown, would have no role in filling ecclesiastical offices. The establishment clause prevents the government from appointing ministers, and the free exercise clause prevents it from interfering with the freedom of religious groups to select their own. This understanding of the religion clause was reflected in two events involving James Madison, described as the leading architect of the religious clause of the First Amendment. Here I will put on my historian's hat briefly. The first occurred in 1806 when John Carroll, the first Catholic bishop in the United States, solicited the executive's opinion on who should be appointed to direct the affairs of the Catholic Church in the territory newly acquired by the Louisiana Purchase. Now, by the way, if any of you sitting here today is waiting for the New York Cardinal Dolan to call President Obama with a similar request as to who we ought to make auxiliary bishops, please see me immediately after the panel, <laughs> because as a Brooklyn boy, I have a bridge that I would be delighted to sell you. The Chief Justice continued to explain in his decision, after consulting with President Jefferson, who was then Secretary of State Madison, responded that the selection of church functionaries was an entirely ecclesiastical matter left to the church's own judgment. The scrupulous policy of the Constitution in guarding against the political interface with religious affairs, Madison explained, prevented the government from rendering an opinion on the selection of ecclesiastical individuals. The second episode occurred in 1811, when Madison was president. Congress had passed a bill incorporating the Protestant Episcopal Church in the town of Alexandria in what was then the District of Columbia. Madison vetoed the bill on the ground that it exceeds the rightful authority to which governments are limited by the ecclesiastical distinction between civil and religious functions and violates, in particular, the Articles of the Constitution of the United States, which declares that Congress shall make no law respecting a religious establishment. The bill enacts into and establishes by law, he wrote, sundry rules and proceedings relative purely to the organization and polity of the church, incorporated and comprehending even the election and the removal of the minister of the same, so that no change could be made therein by the particular society or by the general church of which a member and whose authority it recognizes. Now in the Arizona Christian School tuition case, which you're going to hear a lot about later today, the court ruled that the respondents could not take advantage of the narrow exception created by Flast versus Cohen, the exception to the general rule against taxpayer standing. As a non-specialist in the area, I assure you that a lack of standing is the district court judge's best friend in <laughs> continuing to remain blissfully ignorant of the nuances about which you are about to hear from the experts. On June 28th of 2010, however, Justice Ginsburg delivered the opinion of the court in the CLS versus Martinez case. She considered it a novel question, and she wrote, quote, in a series of decisions, this court has emphasized that the First Amendment generally precludes public universities from denying student organizations access to school-sponsored forums because of the group's viewpoints. This case concerns a novel question, she wrote, regarding student activities at public universities. 
may a public law school condition its official recognition of a student group and the attendant use of the school funds and facilities on the organization's agreement to open eligibility for membership and leadership to all students. CLS believed and accept all comers policy impaired its First Amendment right to free speech, expression and association, and the free exercise of religion by prompting it on pain of relinquishing the advantage of recognition to accept members who did not share the organization's core belief about religion and sexual orientation. And CLS sought special dispensation from the across the board policy. <clears throat> Justice Ginsburg ruled for the court Quote, in accord with the District Court and the Court of Appeals, we reject CLS's First Amendment challenge. Compliance with Hastings' all-comers policy, we conclude, is a reasonable viewpoint. Neutral condition on access to the student organization and forum. And requiring CLS in common with all other student organizations to choose between welcoming of all students and foregoing the benefits <laughs> of official recognition. We hold Hastings did not transgress constitutional limitations. CLS, it bears emphasis, seeks not parity with other organizations, but a preferential exemption from Hastings policy. The First Amendment shields CLS against state prohibition of the organization's expressive activity, however exclusionary that activity may be. But CLS enjoys no constitutional right to state subvention of its selectivity. Our panel will now lead us through this tangled judicial landscape. And I will begin by asking Mr. Marshall to address the question, what's the difference between subvention of selectivity and subversion of selectivity? <laughs> well, like any academic, I'll dodge the question as best as I can. Uh, <laughs> I was going to, uh, my job, my task here is to, first of all, thank, thank you all for coming out and thank the Federalist Society for asking me to, uh, to participate. Um, I really love this organization and I'm not part of it, as you, some of you may know, um, but I think that uh, this organization has had a tremendous benefit in opening up your panels like this to views from all sides. And I really appreciate that. I keep telling people I came from a family where my dad was a conservative Republican and my mom was a liberal Democrat so we talked about this at the table you know we talked issues talking fully I learned later my mom was a lot smarter but still uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea of the open conversation that you offer and I want to thank you all once again for, for, for having me here Judge Kuntz pointed out you know, this is an area noted for its confusion it's not just noted for its confusion by outside critics the court itself keeps on admitting how confused it is in this area and where else, as Justice Scalia has said, that the governing establishment clause test is like a ghoul that keeps on getting killed and keeps on appearing in, in the horror movies. And he's descriptively accurate uh, when he does that. Uh, this is a very, very confused area of law. But I think unlike a lot of other areas of law where, where you can really um, place a little bit of perhaps not thinking to the court and just reacting, I think this area, there are a lot of good reasons why the jurisprudence here is confused. That, that really transcend any, any improper decision making by the courts. One, Judge Kuntz already, already discussed, the Establishment Clause might be seen to be in tension with the uh, Free Exercise Clause and the Free Speech Clause. That leads to a confusing doctrine. Um, the background of, of the clauses is, is uh, you know, the Establishment Clause really came from a conservative Christian thought that there was nothing worse for religion than the corruption of the state. But as Philip has written in, uh, in, in some of his books, some of that was colored a bit by some of our establishment clause and our notions have been colored by an anti-Catholicism that pervaded some of 19th century thought. So even our background is a little bit wavering on this. Uh, with respect to the establishment clause, you do have this directive. Uh, and at the same time, you have major icons of our of our society that aren't going to go away, even if we do have an establishment. Might we have San Francisco, we have Los Angeles, we have Zion National Park, and we really and do we really want to take out the vestiges <coughs> of religion that are so deeply ingrained in our in our culture? Um, more contemporaneously, the the notion between religion and non-religion has evaporated as 
more notions of religions have developed. Uh, this, the, the process, I think, began as a matter of law in the, uh, in the draft cases when the court, in looking at what conscientious objectors and who was entitled to that, started watering down the notion that conscience and deep conscience necessarily had to come from a religious foundation and might also come from comparable, deeply held secular, secular beliefs. And, and also the definition, uh, the, the question of the definition of religion, this very term that is central to what we're talking about today, to define it might create an establishment violation in its own sense. I mean, how do you define religion in a way that is necessarily inclusive or exclusive and by engaging in that legal that legal mechanism, do you violate the very clauses you're, you're bound to serve? And then how do you find out? You've got to inquire into it, and that can raise all kinds of concerns about, about uh, investigation of religion and, and, uh, and, and entanglement with religion to figure it out. So it's a background that is very confusing and leads to very confusing cases, and the court has given us a very confusing doctrine. Actually, what I'm about to say is that at least when we take a look at the appearance of the doctrine right now, it seems to have stabilized a bit in terms of what it looks like. But I think at the same time that it's stabled a bit superficially, the foundations are still not there, and so I think it's fairly hard to develop a coherent sense of what the Establishment Clause really means. And I'm not going to go as far back as Judge Kuntz did. I'm going to take us back a little bit to the, to, to the 80s, the 1980s, to start my discussion. At that point, you had, a, uh, you had a very active, or at least in theory, free exercise clause. The notion of the compelling interest test, that in order to be able to justify a burden on religion, the state had to support it by a compelling interest. That was Justice Brennan's decision in Sherbert. It was never followed the way that the test was read, but at least it was there. You had a very, very deep and very active free exercise clause. At the same time, you also had a fairly <laughs> active and rigidly enforced establishment clause. So it prevented a lot of kinds of aids to, to religious schools, for example. Uh, and you had a fairly prominent, again, free exercise clause. That all began to change in the 1980s on both. Uh, in Mueller versus Allen, which was the case upholding the Minnesota tax deduction for, par for parents whose children attended parochial school, the court seemed to move toward a notion of neutrality, that if a government benefit program provided religious, gr religious groups benefits on the same terms that applied to non-religious groups, the court might uphold that. Even though, as in the case in Mueller and later parochial aid cases, it was quite clear that the predominant beneficiaries of those programs were religious, religious organizations. But as long at least as the program was formally neutral, and this later extended to the, to the famous voucher case, the court upheld and moved to those, uh, would uphold those programs, a softening of what I think the Establishment Law Clause doctrine had been prior to those cases. At the same time, on the free exercise grounds, uh, 20 years ago now, Justice Scalia in Employment Division versus Smith abandoned the compelling interest test, saying that what in fact that test did was create, uh, make every person a law unto themselves, because one of the problems with religion is any, any belief can be characterized as religious, and that if you gave deference to every person's idiosyncratic religious belief, as Justice Scalia indicated, that would be uh, creating a law unto itself. And on that basis, he abandoned the old compelling interest test. Justice Scalia's opinion in this respect did something that hasn't been done since, which is he united the left and the right completely. <laughs> Uh, and the response was the passing of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. I actually defended Smith at that point. It's probably why I have tenure. So um, I'm, very, I'm, forever, I'm forever grateful to, to, to him for that opinion. But that was, again, that softened and made neutral, in effect. There was going to be no special benefits for religion. Uh, that's what Justice Ginsburg's quote comes from in Martinez. And what these cases together, I think, what Mueller and Smith seemed to, seemed to suggest together was an imposition of a, of a neutrality. Reli this meant religious organizations could enjoy benefits granted to secular organizations. We see this in the aid to faith-based organizations programs that are out there. But at the same time, religions would not get any special benefit uh, under the free exercise clause if a non-religious believer would not get an exemption from a law, then a religious believer would not either. 
Uh, the result of this, and we're going to see this later on with, what are the, uh, with the comments, I think, by the, those who followed, is that much of religion litigation now is litigated on free speech grounds and not on free exercise grounds. And that leads again to a theoretical question that has been raised a lot since the advent of Mueller and Smith and the cases that followed, is is religious, religion any more constitutionally distinctive? Uh, has it, have we swallowed it completely into free speech or maybe equal protection grounds? In a couple of areas, it still is. On one side, you still have religion is treated more adversely with respect to what the government can display. You can't display the Ten Commandments in the public schools, but you could display David Letterman's top ten in the public schools. Uh, on, the, uh, on, the other, on the other side, there are still some situations where, where some benefits for religion are allowed, not constitutionally compelled ones, but legislative ones. And the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, although it does no longer apply to the states after it was struck down on Section 5 grounds, still applies to the federal government. And the Free Exercise Clause also applies when religion is singled out for adverse treatment. That's the Lakumi Babalu case. Although you might ask yourself, is that really, could they have done the same thing under the Equal Protection Clause as they did under the Free Exercise Clause? And the question is still whether free exercise is distinctive. And that leads us to, again, I'm setting the table for the discussion coming later on, or what is the next wave? And where are we going from here with respect to the religion clauses? Well, partly it's not going to be on the religion clauses. It's going to be on the basis of how we interpret legislative exemption programs such as RIFRA, and I think that's going to take a major play in the conscience cases coming up with respect to the health care law and other kinds of laws like that. They're going to be decided on statutory grounds. We're also seeing, now that, now that religion has been able to participate in getting benefits uh, similar to other kinds of groups on, on, on uh, programs like, like Charitable Choice or Aid to Faith-Based Organizations, we're, not, we're now beginning to see some some movement or some efforts for religious organizations to claim that they should then have some exceptions, exemptions from the regulations applicable to those groups that, that maybe uh, secular groups don't have, like to be able to hire their own members. And even in the voucher case, the Cleveland voucher case, uh, you might remember that one of the reasons that the court looked at that they upheld it was that, was that the uh, groups who are going to get vouchers uh, the schools who are eligible for kids getting vouchers had to agree not to be able to discriminate on the basis of religion. And there are some folks who have challenged that as saying, well, once we get the voucher, it then, it then interferes with our religious rights if, if further conditions are being imposed on that. So we'll need to see where those cases are going to go. The conscience cases, which I've, already, which I've already discussed, and in the interest of time, I will not repeat. And then we get to the Hosanna Tabor case, which has just thrown everything open because Anybody who can come up to me afterwards and explain to me why, what that decision means other than the fact everybody knows that there was always a religious exemption. We're not going to require the Catholic Church to hire women <coughs> to be priests. Uh, and it says anything other than that in terms of theory, I'm waiting to hear it because uh, I, haven't heard it explained, I haven't heard it explained quite yet. But there's no question that the Hosanna Tabor case is providing a seed to suggest that maybe we will see a more invigorated free exercise clause um, than we have seen previously. Again, we started off with a fairly vigorous establishment clause and a fairly vigorous free exercise clause. We've softened it on both, so that I don't think we have at this particular point a vigorous establishment clause or a vigorous free exercise clause uh, on most of the issues that are facing us. There, I think, is a movement uh, to weaken the Establishment Clause even further in, in terms of symbol cases, but to strengthen free exercise, and that is coming from the Hosanna Tabor case. And we'll see how, we will see how that plays out. The irony, by the way, and one irony of the Hosanna Tabor case, is if that case is explained on the basis of the rights of institutional religion, uh, it might mean that we're going to see for the first time, and this I think is inconsistent uh, with, with what I've read about the founding period, where the, the, where the religious exercise right, rights of institutional religion might be considered greater in the way it plays out in doctrine than the rights of individuals advocating religious belief. So with that introduction, uh, I will sit down now. So thank you very much.
believe Philip now has something to say. <laughs> Thank you. Great pleasure to be here. And uh, it's always a pleasure li listening to Bill. And particularly here, I want to pick up on one of his themes, uh, namely that in religion litigation, we may be seeing some emphasis on freedom of speech. Um, and I'd like to actually talk about a very practical element of this. I want to talk about 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code. I know you thought this was the religion panel, not the tax panel, but I'm a former tax lawyer. Sorry, I can't help myself. My thesis, and forgive me, this is not quite academic. It's quite practical. 501c3 is unconstitutional, and you can make attorneys get attorney's fees in challenging it. That's my thesis. <laughs> That's why I wanted so much to be here. Um, so what does 501c3 do? It exempts religious, educational, and other charitable organizations from federal income taxes. It denies exemptions, exemptions to them, though, if they engage in electioneering or if a substantial part of their activities consists of lobbying. In other words, there's no tax exemption for churches that exercise their freedom of political speech in the course of politics. Uh, you know, it's one thing to limit political speech, but here the focus is on political speech in politics. It's okay for churches to speak politically outside political contests, but not in politics. And one can scarcely imagine a more draconian abridgment of the freedom of speech. And this is the paradox of 501c3. We have two central and highly protected First Amendment rights. There's religious liberty and there's political speech. But here's the magic trick. When you combine the two together, the freedom disappears. Two constitutional rights that just cancel each other out. <laughs> now, that's a little puzzling. Uh, how do they do this? Uh, it, well, it's been there since 1954. In fact, Ooh, someone disapproves. The IRS. IRS, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> They're watching, listening. <laughs> so in, in fact, in fa but notice, if you name the evil, it goes away. Uh, in, fact, <laughs> in fact, first, first there, there are many First Amendment rights here. We often think of 501c3 in terms of religion or in terms of political speech. There's actually a lot going on. There's the general freedom of religion of the churches and of the individuals within them. There's also the freedom of speech generally. But then there's also the right to petition. What is lobbying but the right to petition? I know we don't pay much attention to that, but that's there too. And then, of course, if we think of the freedom of religion, there's a very particular aspect of that that deserves attention here, the right to pray. Now, how is that involved here? 501c3 sweepingly limits praying for a candidate's success. Imagine a preacher at the, at the pulpit praying for the success of a well, no tax exemption for you, right? It's quite astonishing. It only limits conversation amongst us secular beings, but conversations with God. So that's a fairly ambitious little section, 501c3. Now, I'm just going to focus, I'm going to talk about speech generally, but as I go along, feel free to substitute in your mind petition, prayer, etc. So there are two possible perspectives I want to focus on here with regard to 501c3. First, is it a direct constraint? Second, is it an unconstitutional condition? First, direct constraints on political speech. Well, yes, I think it is one. Formally, 501c3 grants an exemption from taxes, and thus one might say it's a mere privilege, not a constraint. Now, of course, liberals say there's no difference between privilege and constraint, but for these purposes, they're happy to say it's a mere privilege and we can constrain it. But it's not the sort of privilege that amounts to a grant of a benefit. It's not like a gift of money or of land. On the contrary, the, the government doesn't give money to the churches. It merely refrains from taxing them. It merely takes its hands off from money that is already theirs. And so in reality, the government is simply reducing the tax rate to zero if churches silence themselves. You have a low rate for churches that silence themselves and a higher tax rate for, church, um, for, for churches that speak, that refuse to silence themselves. And so what we really have here is a direct 
penalty and political speech. And this isn't just a matter of legal realism contrasting the formality and, and what's really going on. The code itself, if you, you, take, you should take the document as a whole, not just the particular section. The code is all about setting tax rates, and this section simply lowers the tax rate for churches that comply. Well, if you're not satisfied with that direct, uh, direct constraint analysis, let's turn to unconstitutional conditions. And we can begin with Supreme Court doctrine. Much is unclear under Supreme Court doctrine on, on constitutional conditions, but here we're on pretty firm territory. The con conditions were said, in this said in this doctrine must be germane and proportionate to a legitimate government interest. Well, here, Whatever the government interest may be, it does not justify sweeping prohibitions on political speech in politics. It's an extraordinarily severe draconian limitation. The government may have an interest of all sorts. It may have an interest in limiting the money, the use of government money, or here, your own untaxed money. I don't quite get that, but that's what they say. Um, and perhaps then it can limit the use of that money that it doesn't take or that it allegedly gives. But how does that justify sweeping bars on the central type of speech? That doesn't make sense. I thought these limits on speech are meant to be narrowly tailored. This isn't narrowly tailored. It's meant to be germane and proportionate. This isn't proportionate or germane. The government, it said, has an interest in separating church and state. Well, I have too much to say on that, so I'll just skip it. Suffice to say, even if it were true that the government has an interest in separating church and state, how does protecting one First Amendment right require abridging another First Amendment right? So in order to protect the alleged fictional separation of church and state, you have to take away the very clear right to political speech in politics? This condition clearly is neither germane nor proportionate. Now, there are all sorts of possible objections to the unconstitutional conditions analysis. So for example, you might say, well, where's the government force? There's no government force here. But notice, the condition is actually backed by the force of law, right? Because the government can recover back taxes and exempt income for failure to comply with the condition. That's the force of law. Uh, you might object, well, the condition is cured by consent. Well, consent cannot give the federal government a power that the Constitution and the First Amendment specifically denies to the government. How can private consent create or enlarge public power. It just doesn't make sense. So it seems to be an unconstitutional condition. Now, let's get to the punchline. How is litigation practicable and profitable? <laughs> yes, this is what really matters, uh, not the constitutional law. So it's not necessary to challenge the IRS, is it? Instead, interestingly, one can challenge state law and get attorney's fees under 42 U.S.C. 1983. Now, how could that be, you may ask? Because many state tax laws piggyback on 501c3. So I'm, I'll just quote you from Texas law, but you can go across the United States and find many examples. Texas, uh, for example, uh, exempts a church from the Texas franchise tax where, quote, a, a nonprofit corporation, it is a nonprofit corporation exempted from the federal income tax under Section 501c3. And you have to have one of those uh, IRS letters saying that you're exempt. And of course, if you've applied to the IRS and ostentatiously are political and don't get one of those letters, you see what follows. In short, the lawfulness of 501c3 speech restrictions can, I think, finally be challenged in an action under Section 1983. And so 501c3, I think, can be both unconstitutional and profitable. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor. Thank you, Judge. <laughs> Uh, and thanks to the organizers. Uh, I was uh, asked to speak on the subject of the Christian Legal Society versus Martinez case. Uh, uh, as, as many of you may know, I had the uh, honor of representing the Christian Legal Society in the case, representing them in the Supreme Court, writing the briefs, making the argument. Um, and uh, I almost said, no, I'd rather talk about something else. Um, I really don't like sour grapes. Um, I would rather move on, you know, not necessarily .org. Uh, 
but I do like, I would rather move on. Um, and I always think that, you know, losing counsel, you know, they, they, uh, you look kind of shabby and, and, and uh, self-interested and so forth. And uh, maybe not if you can magnanimously say, oh, the court got it right and I was stand corrected. I, but I, I, I uh, that would show a certain generosity of spirit. Uh, uh, I, but not in this particular case, much candor, because I, I do regard this decision as being one of the uh, extreme low points for civil liberties uh, uh, in America. Uh, the case also uh, is difficult for me to talk about because um, much of the irritation I feel about it is like, it, it, it comes, it's, it's partly what's in Ju Justice Alito's a dissent, which is the extraordinary degree to which the majority just disregarded the actual facts in the record, and what really went on in the case, and the arguments that were actually made by the parties, and instead um, uh, decided a case which had been made up at the last time, at the really at the last moment in the midst of litigation by the university, and that had. You know, almost nothing to do with uh, with what uh, went on, but and that's extremely irritating. But I don't. But it isn't very illuminating. It doesn't. I'm um, not very edifying uh, to talk about. So what I would like to do is to talk about this case uh, as if it really were the case presented in the majority, and ask what are the enduring issues of civil liberties which are uh, uh, raised by it, and what I would like to suggest. Uh, to you is that civil libertarians should be very disturbed by this decision, even those who don't particularly like religion, even those who may think that the Christian legal society is some sort of, uh, of uh, uh, Neanderthalish cabal, right? But for people who believe in civil liberties in general, and so that's what I would like to talk about. For those who don't know the case, just briefly, the facts are these. Uh, that Hastings uh, is a public university, a public law school in the a city of uh, San Francisco. Uh, they have created a forum uh, specifically for the purpose of, of having diversity and discussion among student groups. There are about 60 some odd student groups of the usual uh, uh, variety. Uh, uh, and for many years, uh, there has been a chapter of the Christian Legal Society uh, there. Uh, they were unmolested for many years, even though they had a creedal re requirement. They, they require that those people who lead the organization are Christians, um, and, the, and, and that defined by their own uh, uh, statement of faith, and those who have voting membership status, those who, who control the, the policies of the organization. Uh, uh, similarly, so they, they, they have this odd view uh, that uh, they don't want their Bible studies led by atheists. Uh, and one might think that this is a little bit like demanding that the captain of the tennis team be able to play tennis, uh, but uh, that, that's, uh, uh, anyway, for many years they were there. Uh, when the university became aware that one of the beliefs of conservative Christian organizations and these students was that uh, sex should be confined to, to the people who are married, uh, they changed their minds and they said, oh no, we can no longer have you on campus. You can't use our classrooms. You can't use our, our uh, email system. You cannot uh, be listed on our internet as a student organization. You cannot be on campus uh, if you hold to uh, that particular uh, uh, belief. Now what they said was that this discriminates on the basis of religion. Uh, you insist that you have Christians, by your definition, uh, leading the organization and also uh, a sexual orientation. Um, the, uh, the two points of constitutional doctrine that I want to call your attention to uh, today are freedom of association uh, and the public forum doctrine under uh, freedom of speech. And these are uh, distinct claims. The Supreme Court in a series of cases has held quite uh, unequivocally 
that private communicative groups like the Christian Legal Society, like the Boy Scouts of America, like uh, so many groups, uh, uh, the Sierra Club, uh, a Federalist Society, uh, you name it, even the ACS has this right, um, the, uh, have the right to uh, choose their own members and leaders because the composition of a group and especially its leaders constitute the organization and its uh, expressive uh, uh, purpose. And, and the, the only times that the court has hesitated to enforce that is where the limitations on membership don't seem to be directly related to the uh, philosophical point of view of the organization. So for example, in the Boy Scouts case, where I also represented uh, the organization, the only thing that the dissent really worried about was do the Boy Scouts really have a philosophical objection to, uh, uh, to homosexuals serving as scoutmasters? If they did, then the case was uh, pretty uh, straightforward. When, well, nobody questions that the Christian Legal Society, uh, requ their requirement that you be a Christian actually is related to the philosophy of the group. So um, <laughs> that was undisputed. Hastings didn't even, uh, so, it, so it, it, the case, it, it is unequivocally undisputed in this case that the CLS chapter has a freedom of association constitutional right for to be able to have its leaders and its voting members Christians. So, and, 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 and so how did they lose? So the, the claim here was structured in, as follows. We have a constitutional right. Because we exercise that right, we, 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 the organization, forfeited a generally available public benefit, that is the, the otherwise available right we had to be, to be able to meet in, as, as a student group in classrooms and so forth. All right. um, so um, the, 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 two, the two doctrinal moves that I want to call attention to that I think are, are, are dreadful mistakes for civil liberties in this portion uh, of the decision are first. First, the court seemed to hold, I think it did hold, that freedom of association claims are not, cannot be brought distinct from freedom of speech claims. That if you have both those claims, that the freedom of association claim merges into the free speech claim. That is actually the, um, uh, the court's language, uh, the, the, the court, court says uh, that their two arguments merge. Uh, the court says it makes little sense to treat the speech and association claims as discrete uh, and basically says if you can't win under the free speech clause, then you lose under freedom of association clause because you can't bring both. Now, I went to law school. I must have missed the class where they said you can't bring two different constitutional claims arising from the same set of facts. Uh, I, I don't, I'm, I'm genuinely baffled where the court came up with this idea. But it is insidious because freedom of speech and freedom of association do not protect exactly the same thing. They are closely intertwined, as the court says, but they, predict, they protect different aspects of, of expressive freedom. Speech claims are focused on what is said. That is why the doctrine has to do with viewpoints, right? Protecting against the government playing favorites with respect to viewpoints. Associational rights have to do with who you are, the constitution of the group, right? And under freedom of association, all groups have the right to choose their leaders and their members even if the restriction on that isn't, is, is, is entirely viewpoint neutral. Every freedom of association case in the modern court has involved a, new, a viewpoint neutral public accommodation law as applied to some private organization. Right? They've never been viewpoint discriminatory. Freedom of association is not about viewpoint discrimination. It is about the group's right to be able to constitute itself, choose its leaders, choose its members. Uh, and by the way, uh, Judge Coons read, read from the opinion uh, in which um, 
uh, the court says several times, it is to be emphasized that the Christian Legal Society seeks a preferential exemption from the rule. That is not the freedom of association claim at all. We did not seek a preferential exemption from the rule. We, we argued that it is facially unconstitutional for a governmental entity to interfere with a private expressive association's right to choose its leaders and members, all groups, all groups. We didn't seek an exemption from a rule. We sought to vindicate the freedom of association that should belong to every group, not just at Hastings, but every group in a free civil society. It's right there on paragraph one uh, of the brief, if you want to check and make sure that I'm not making it up after the fact. Uh, so these two rights are different. They are distinct rights. They have different elements. To merge the freedom of association right into the free speech claim, and then say you lose on freedom of association because you couldn't carry a free speech claim, means that freedom of association was written out. Right. Now, does it matter that this comes in the context of a public forum? I think not, because that's just the enforcement mechanism. That's the penalty that was dealt out to this group for exercise of its constitutional rights. Imagine that Hastings said no student group can meet on campus unless they all agree uh, to, uh, uh, to suspicionless strip searches before their meetings. Right. Fourth Amendment violation, right? enforced by de denial of equal access to the, to the forum. No one, I think, would say that, oh, well, this is a public forum case, and so it, only if it's a free speech problem can you raise your constitutional right. Fourth Amendment has, it has its protections. Freedom of association has its protections. Speech has its pr protections. You cannot exclude groups from otherwise available a pub access to public forums on account of their exercise of other constitutional rights and they don't merge. Uh, second problem is that the court uh, held uh, that freedom of association is protected only against outright governmental compulsion and not uh, against the denial of, of benefits. So the court says it is important that, uh, that Hastings, I'm reading now from the opinion, is dangling the carrot of subsidy, uh, not wielding the stick of prohibition. Uh, and the court says that the precedent, these, the freedom of association precedents, uh, involved regulations that compelled, that's in italics in the opinion, a group to include unwanted members with no choice uh, to opt out. Uh, in other words, the unconstitutional conditions doctrine doesn't apply to freedom of association. Now, two problems with that. One, precedent. I'd like to quote just my former boss, Justice Brennan, who wrote, government actions that may unconstitutionally infringe upon this freedom, this is freedom of association, can take a number of forms. Among other things, government may seek to impose penalties or withhold benefits from individuals because of their membership uh, in the group, citing one of the public university for, uh, uh, forum cases. Uh, precedent is plainly contrary to this, but so is logic, because there is no reason why freedom of association would be any different from any other uh, of, uh, of, uh, of our rights. They all have the same structure. You have certain freedoms, and the government may not impinge upon those freedoms by denying you otherwise generally available benefits. Right? That's been held uh, in, in for uh, way back into the 20s for some cases. Free speech was extended in the 50s. Free exercise it was extended in the 60s. Much of this was done by the liberal justices like my former boss, Justice Brennan, whom I'm confident would have dissented in this illiberal uh, case. Uh, so how much more time do I have? I'm sorry. As much as you like. You're a court of appeals judge. Okay. <laughs> well. Uh, <laughs> I'll deal uh, with these uh, professor uh, times later. If, <laughs> if, if he tries to shut me up, I'm going to reverse. Uh, 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 so, that, so freedom of association eviscerated in two different ways. Right? How about public forum doctrine? Uh, a similar wrecking ball uh, through uh, the, the liberal precedents recognizing freedom of speech in the context of public forums. Begin with the rhetoric, 
all through this opinion that what are we talking about? We're talking about subsidies, we're talking about subventions, we're talking about benefits, right? Never before has the United States Supreme Court described access to an otherwise available public forum as a subsidy. We haven't heard that kind of talk since Justice Holmes said that, you'd, that, uh, that a, a, a preacher named Davis did not have the right to preach on Boston Common because the city owns the property and so you don't have a right to go, go in the park. We had, I, I thought this died when Justice Rehnquist in his early days used to fight a rear guard action to say that all government benefits are, are, are you know, the government has a great deal of discretion in this area, uh, but uh, he lost out to Justice Brennan uh, and, the, uh, and the others, and even he came around in the last 10 years and recognized that, um, that there, if, if government benefits are generally available to all people on the basis of neutral criteria, it, it is not subsidizing people to allow them to take advantage of them. To be treated equally under the terms of a statute is not a subsidy. And the government does not have the right to pick and choose uh, its favored groups and its disfavored groups with respect to generally available public benefits. Yes, there is something called subsidies. Things like grants to organizations or subsidies, particular benefits that are not generally available, and the government does have substantial discretion with respect to those. It can even discriminate on the basis of viewpoint in doing that. It can give a grant to the National Association for Democracy without giving a grant to the National Association for Fascism. It's okay for subsidies. Right. And most recently, the court drew this line very clearly in the case. I don't like the result in it, but this line of analysis was, was absolutely right in, in, in Locke versus Davey. There is a difference between generally available public benefits, like being able to use empty classrooms if you're a student group at a public university, and discretionary grants. And the Supreme Court um, uh, lowered public forum doctrine, that is, access to property on equal terms, to, the, uh, to making it look like it's just a subsidy or, or, uh, or a grant. And in the course of it, watered down almost every element that had been used to protect speakers who were being uh, uh, discriminated against by, uh, uh, by the government. I'm, I'm talking too long. I'll just tick, tick these off very quickly. Uh, Emphasis upon just application of the mere reasonableness test. No insistence that the reasonableness be in light of the purpose of the forum, which has been the way it has always been stated. That means it has always meant before that limits must have to do, must promote the purpose of the forum. They can't be independent regulatory limitations, however reasonable, enforced by keeping you out of a free speech forum. That was never until this case uh, uh, permitted. It was stipulated in this case that the purpose of the forum, the purpose of the forum was to promote diversity among student groups. Requiring every student group to accept all comers does not promote diversity among groups. It might promote diversity inside groups, but it promotes homogeneity across groups, right? It is manifestly not real. How about, can it possibly be reasonable in light of the purpose of the forum to impose an otherwise unconstitutional condition? If, it's, if uh, this is where freedom of association uh, kicks in and, uh, again. And then in, in prior cases, the court always told us that we look at the actual practice of the government uh, with respect to public forums and not just what they say. You have to look at what they do, not just what they say. If you look at what Hastings did, that's what's uh, Alito's dissent is all about. What they did was manifestly discriminatory and hostile uh, and, and, and changing and arbitrary uh, and, and, and two-faced. Uh, uh, only if you believe this mid-litigation conversion to this uh, ethereal, uh, ostensibly neutral all-comers policy can, could, can you possibly think that this was 
a neutral policy, but that the court had never before confined itself to what the government says, always looking to the actual practice in public forum cases. I'm going to conclude here, but just say um, civil libertarians should be very concerned, not just those of us who might like, might be sympathetic to religion. This could, this, these arsenals of statism can be directed against speakers of any shape, description, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a sad day that this former ACLU lawyer, now on the Supreme Court, uh, uh, could not see it that way. Thank you. Corey, you now have 45 seconds. No, I'm <laughs> Judges take care of their own. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm thankful for the invitation to such a wonderful uh, and invigorating conference. Uh, I'm going to agree uh, with Michael McConnell that there is a serious flaw uh, in the opinion, in the Christian Legal Society uh, opinion. Uh, but unlike him, I'm going to defend uh, the result. I think there was a much cleaner and sensible way uh, to, to get there. Um, the way, I think, uh, to, to, for Hastings originally to have argued and eventually for the court to have decided the case, I think is along the lines of Bob Jones University, uh, which uh, is a 501c3 uh, case. And so that, that'll bring us to some of the remarks, too, that Philip Hamburger uh, has made. Uh, it is the 25, uh, 25th uh, anniversary of Bob Jones, and I'll suggest, too, that there's something about the subsequent history that we know now that, uh, that some of the worries that were raised at the time, I, I think, just turn out not to be true. Uh, I don't know if it's a tradition at the Federal Society to, uh, to make fun of uh, 60s law professors from, from Yale. J Justice Alito did that quite well the other night. Uh, I'll have something to say about another uh, I think it's on a par with uh, Greening of, of America, and almost a narrative, a worry uh, raised by uh, uh, Robert Cover, uh, worries about Bob Jones, I think, that turned out not to be true. Um, the question, I think, or the confusion in the opinion that I want to bring out uh, is about the, the notion of viewpoint neutrality uh, itself. I agree with uh, Michael McConnell uh, that there really is a confusion in the opinion about what constitutes uh, uh, a viewpoint neutral policy, and it, I, I think it's right to say that the all comers policy, in a sense, is not viewpoint neutral. But the, the question ultimately is whether that is a problem uh, when it comes to the, the, to use the text, the abridgment of free speech, and, and I don't think it is. Uh, let's just look at the doctrine of viewpoint neutrality. I think that's the first place to start and to ask about its logic. Um, the doctrine of viewpoint neutrality uh, rightly is an interpretation of the worry about abridgment or the, the, the prohibition on abridgment of free speech of our First Amendment. Uh, it says that uh, most fundamentally that if one is ex expressing uh, uh, a viewpoint on a matter of politics or, or, um, or other matters of, uh, uh, of, of controversy, uh, that they're entitled to protection uh, from bans most uh, significantly. So think of the court's opinion in Virginia versus Black, uh, a, a case that would have been decided differently anywhere else in the world, and this is an American exceptionalist case in the best sense, I think, uh, that we resist the way the rest of the world does this. Uh, in the rest of the world, if there was a question of cross-burning or hate speech, uh, it would simply be, you know, banned, that we protect free speech, but there's a balance. Uh, but the court in Virginia versus Black uh, protects at least, uh, not threats, but uh, uh, cross-burning during uh, a rally uh, on a field by the Ku Klux Klan, out of the belief, uh, the right belief, I think, that all viewpoints, uh, even if they're heinous, deserve protection, and that's true as well of uh, fascist viewpoints, for instance, uh, uh, think of the Skokie case and, and uh, mar the march by, by Nazis. Um, uh, but we have to, I think, be concerned to unpack, again, the reasons for viewpoint neutrality. Uh, in Virginia versus Black, there is a contradiction, I think, between the content of the viewpoint expressed by the Klan, and this is true of uh, Nazi viewpoints too, and the reasons for the protection, and that's brought out to some degree in the O'Connor opinion. Uh, when she says this deserves a uh, protection, 
But the viewpoint of the Ku Klux Klan is at odds with the fundamental values of the Constitution. We have an equal protection clause that the Klan is founded in opposition to, the idea of equality under law. So in a sense, we are protecting a viewpoint, uh, yes, for, because of the doctrine of viewpoint neutrality, but a viewpoint that is fundamentally at odds with the Constitution. Now it is fundamental, I think, in a constitutional regime with this unique in the world rule, viewpoint neutrality, protecting all viewpoints from uh, from criminalization or from bans, that there also be a way for the state to express the reasons why we have this viewpoint or the reasons for the right. Uh, and the state speech doctrine or the notion of government speech certainly allows that in a lot of common sense areas. So think of uh, civics education. When we're teaching the Constitution, we teach the idea of the Equal Protection Clause and its incompatibility with groups uh, like the Klan who are opposing it. And I think rightly, uh, civics teachers, I was just talking to a civics teacher uh, earlier uh, from Pennsylvania, civics teachers defend the Constitution. And that is defending a viewpoint. They defend the idea of equal protection under law and they tell the story of the 14th Amendment. Uh, uh, similarly, I think public holidays uh, often affirm the viewpoint of the Constitution. Uh, and that's true, uh, uh, for instance, of Martin Luther King Day. We don't celebrate Bull Connor Day, right? Although that is a viewpoint uh, as well. Uh, so Bob Jones uh, uh, um, is a case uh, that many of you will remember. Uh, uh, Bob Jones admits African Americans into the university, uh, but they have a series of discriminatory rules once these students are allowed in. Most significantly, they ban interracial dating. Uh, they also ban membership in the NAACP or advocacy of the right to interracial marriage. Uh, and during the Nixon administration, the, the IRS looks at 501c3 and asks the question of whether or not Bob Jones uh, is pursuing a charitable or a public purpose. The language of the statute is charitable, and then the argument is, look, charitable has to involve some commitment uh, to at least not being at odds with the fundamental commitments of the Constitution. And even if they're not, because they admit black students violating uh, the letter um, of any particular statute, it's, it looks like they're violating the idea of a charitable purpose. And so uh, the 501c3 status of Bob Jones University is revoked and the court hears the case uh, and they essentially make the argument that 501c3 is a subsidy and it's an instance in which the government is promoting some conception of the public good, rightly in my opinion. Uh, the question that Philip raises is a good one. Where, where is the benefit come from? It just looks like you're, you're not, not taxing. But think of the difference between 501c3 and 501c4. In 501c3, if I give money to Bob Jones University under the previous instance or any charitable group, uh, I get a deduction. And the court's argument, this seems sensible to me, is that's just different than tax exemption. There's a subsidy there. That's an indirect subsidy. You're subsidizing it through uh, individuals. Uh, I said I would promise mocking a, a Yale Law professor from the 1960s. Robert Cover in Nomos and Narrative, not the most clearly written piece, but uh, uh, widely regarded as, as a fundamental one, really worries about Bob Jones University because it's going to cut off the possibility of this religion, its existence and the, and the ability of the school to function in the future. But we know now that that just didn't happen. Uh, 501c3 is not a monopoly on uh, receiving funds or, or not required for organizations to exist. Bob Jones University continues to exist. Uh, they were able to raise money uh, without that designation, without that subsidy that comes with 501c3 status. Uh, uh, they're doing fine, it seems to me. And in, you could imagine a hypothetical, just to, to hammer home, the, this is not a monopoly worry uh, or a worry about uh, the only access to funds. Uh, you could imagine uh, uh, an organization doing even better under some different designation uh, without the subsidy. And the denial of the subsidy seems to me to be yet another way of the state uh, promoting its own uh, view. Now CLS is a, a complicated uh, case and I think it is complicated and, and confused uh, largely because the way that Hastings argued it is that they said that, you know, this is a limited public 
forum, and that therefore it triggers viewpoint neutrality, and we have this rule of the all comers policy, and isn't that a nice rule? It's viewpoint neutral because it's about tolerance. Now that seems to me exactly wrong. Viewpoint neutrality is not about tolerance. In fact, the protection of the Klan, that example shows that we are protecting the most intolerant viewpoints in an idea of viewpoint neutrality. It seems to me that what the policy is doing is actually saying, look, we are promoting a certain viewpoint, which is the idea that uh, gays like blacks, and that's how the original policy was written as a non-discrimination policy, uh, uh, in organizations that are subsidized by the Christian Legal Society, sorry, by Hastings, that, that uh, that's the value we want to promote, is the value of inclusion. It's a much cleaner way, just doing it the Bob Jones way, uh, than the, all this talk about viewpoint neutrality. And I completely agree. I think the way that the, both the opinion is written and the way the case was argued, it just confuses the doctrine. Viewpoint neutrality is not about tolerance. It's often about protecting the intolerant. Um, I want to, um, and I agree too about the, you know, the grant uh, analogy. If you know, the, the 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 United States government wants to to set up a fund promoting democratic ideals, it doesn't have to fund uh, the Klan or to fund uh, the Nazi Party. Um, to go back to the, the concern that what this case does is that it rules out the ability to participate at all in a public forum, uh, the dissent and um, uh, uh, rightly invokes the worry about Healy, this case much earlier involving the students uh, from democratic society being banned from campus. Uh, and Alito outlines a possible way that the case might be relitigated if it turns out that the Christian Legal Society uh, was just denied access to, uh, to be on campus. Imagine they were leafleting on campus. That just seems like a completely different case. And I would say that is the restriction of a viewpoint rather than about the subsidy. Uh, but at least as the opinion is written, it, it, it claims that there is no entitlement uh, to the subsidy. Um, the email list, uh, I had a, a case, a, case, a, a d quick decision where a student, we have a, uh, at Brown, a, a, a political theory email listserv and this person wanted to advertise for Occupy, wanted to use the listserv to try to promote uh, Occupy. Um, there are alternative means, I pointed out, uh, on campus to get the idea out, aside from using the, the listserv of the, of the university, one of the listservs of the university. It seems to me here that at least on that issue that there are alternatives. Um, to end even more provocatively, I do think Boy Scouts you know, is a case about compulsion. If it would have been about 501c3 status, if it would have been about the subsidy of the tax deduction, that would have been a different kind of case. It would have looked a lot more uh, like Bob Jones uh, University. Uh, but the precedent, I think, still stands that the, this kind of radical doctrine, can, I give, I've given a version of a talk on free speech around the world, they always say you are a radical, I just want to point this out to this group that might think I'm straying from the doctrine, you are a radical American, you're defending the doctrine of viewpoint neutrality, you think the Klan should be protected, and that is my fundamental view. But I also think that if we're going to have this American exceptionalist doctrine, we have to have a way of articulating and defending the values uh, that underlie it and the values of, um, of uh, uh, the beliefs that are central to the Constitution. Now, of course, the analogy between uh, discrimination against African Americans and discrimination against gays is a controversial one, and I acknowledge that. Um, but I think that Hastings has an entitlement. Remember, this isn't about whether they're right in the end, that they are permitted to say, and this is their view, I think, uh, that there is an analogy between that kind of discrimination and what we are promoting is the idea of inclusion uh, by race uh, and also by sexual orientation. They might be wrong, but the state at least has to have some leeway in expressing that message. And like it or not, uh, it looks like the court's precedents, frankly, are moving in that, uh, in that direction of recognizing discrimination against gays as a, a kind of status discrimination. So the idea that the the Hastings Law School wants to say this, at minimum, I think, should be uh, permitted. Uh, now, I think I had you when I said that uh, I was going to mock a Yale law professor from the 60s. I may have lost you along the thread, but uh, it's still been, been a pleasure uh, to be here, and I look forward to the discussion.
I'm going to occupy the podium lest it be seized by any of the discussants. Um, Bill, why don't we start with you? Do you have any comments you'd like oh, to Oh, I make? got a few. I, 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 agree, <laughs> I agreed to go first in the idea that I could respond. I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to run real quickly. My first response to Philip and all of you out there who want to litigate Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, read it. Uh, uh, with respect, read it very carefully. Read it very carefully. The 501c3 uh, restriction doesn't prohibit anything. It says if you want to get that kind of exemption, you've got to abide by a few rules. It's based on the idea of what is charitable. And the notion is, whether we like it or not, and I think it's probably a good idea to say that if you engage in political activity, it's not charitable work. That's why move on is not going to get 501c3 status. And once you move over and become political, and we can argue where those lines are going to be, you lose your status as that kind of charity. And think about the implications of getting rid of, of the limitation on religious organizations engaging in political activity, the pass-through that will happen when everybody decides that every political contribution they want to make can suddenly become tax deductible and we have a whole new series of religions being developed in order to kind of promote that activity, which would happen. Then you get the question of monitoring to see which of these groups are sham groups or not. Uh, and you get the question that uh, Philip, Philip kept talking about, no conflict between constitutional rights. I mean, in Waltz versus tax exemption, one of the reasons why the court upheld a property tax exemption for religious organizations is it didn't want the government monitoring and seizing church property by the way it would have to if it started taxing. The, kind, the problems that you would get into on the practical matters of, of allowing these pass-throughs that would happen for political activity I think are enormous, and those anti-establishment reasons of non-entanglement think more than justify the restriction that takes place, particularly when this really isn't a restriction on speech. It's only a qualification for getting certain tax benefits. With respect to Christian Legal Society, it is a tough case, and I, I do like Michael's final point where he says, you know, you aren't really promoting diversity if you're promoting homogeneity. And I think that's, that's right, and I think if I was speaking to a a, if I was advising a university on what kind of policy that they might have, I would think maybe you, you should allow Democrats to only have Democrats in the Young Democrats organization or Republicans or whatever. But the question of religion becomes very tough, and this takes me back to my original problem, because one of the other problems we have about religion is we don't really know what we mean when we're talking about it. Are we talking about a series of ideas? When we say we're a Christian, are we saying we have a certain amount of ideas, or is it an identity kind of thing? Why, why do we prohibit discrimination on the basis of religion? The reason is not because we are prohibiting discrimination on the basis of ideas. We, there are no civil rights acts, uh, federal civil rights act, that prohibit discrimination on the basis of political views. This is the reason why we have discrimination against religion is because we're concerned of anti-status animus that has so that has so unfortunately been part of history. The limitations of not allowing Jews into groups or Christians into groups isn't because of the views that are being held there, it's because of the identity, the religious identity that is seen there. Now what happens when you get discrimination in favor of religion? I mean the argument is, you know, just allowing people in my religion to be part of a particular group, that's not anti-animus. That's kind of beneficial discrimination. That, folks, is the affirmative action debate. So think about how far you want to take it. Phil, do you have a comment or two you'd like to make? Just very quickly, uh, you know, one of the saddest things in the development of law in the last 50 years is how the left has abandoned free speech. Uh, it's true as to religion. It's true in the sciences, where we actually have censorship of research, which most people don't even know about. And whether it's in science or religion, it, it, it's really saddening to see what's happened. And so I'm sorry that Bill takes the position he does. Uh, the reality is that, of course, whatever position one takes, there are complexities. But to say that fear of a possible problem should lead one then to deny political speech in the political sphere um, is really quite astonishing. Quite frankly, it's worrying about a gnat and dropping an atom bomb on it. Uh, so I would just encourage everyone here to think, to think about litigating this. Um, I think it could be fun and, as I said, profitable. I'll just stick with that. Uh -huh. uh, Judge? Um, I just say to Bill, that in, in response to his last uh, point, that um, we have 
laws prohibiting discrimination on the basis of religion in certain contexts, uh, not in all, but employment is the most important, Title VII. Uh, but it is one thing to say that General Motors can't discriminate on the basis of religion, and it's another to say that the, that the Roman Catholic Church or the Baptist Church or the Hindus can't. Uh, and Congress, in its wisdom, knew, recognized this and exempted religious organizations from the prohibition on religious discrimination. To say that religious groups can't discriminate on the basis of religion is to say that they have no freedom of association. It, it is, it's, it's perverse and ridiculous. Corey? Thanks. Um, on the issue of um, churches and 501c3 status, I mean, I think the, the best argument for the, the, the fact that, that there is no prohibition on, on churches engaging in political speech is that they could just switch the designation. So if, I'm, if I have a church and I want to engage in substantial political activity, although not a majority, but I want to endorse a candidate, for instance, I can opt into 501c4 status and that will not trigger all sorts of, I mean, that's an option anyway that, that we might consider as a middle, middle ground to allow churches that want to do this. Uh, but 501c3 is about the subsidy, and it's about whether or not uh, through tax deductibility the government is going to subsidize a church. Uh, I know that many of the people here are, uh, are not uh, sympathetic, to say the least, to the idea that, uh, that the Constitution gives us positive rights or entitlements from the government. And my worry is that if we say that, uh, that it's unconstitutional, the notion of tying 501c3 status uh, to uh, the requirement that, that churches not endorse candidates, uh, that, uh, there's a risk that, we, that that becomes a, a strange sort of positive right, uh, and that we're engaging in a surreptitious form of campaign finance reform that might even be constitutionalized. So the things that a lot of the people here, I think, are worried about, you know, that it, it's in a subtle way, I think, giving uh, churches the right to engage in campaigning and the right to receive the subsidy uh, restrain from, from a lot of those commitments that many of the people here have. We're now going to take questions from the audience. I'm going to be ruthless, showing you that I really am a district court judge. This sounds a lot like Lord Vader. Uh, we'll start right here in the center. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Roger Pilano with the Cato Institute. We filed a brief by Richard Epstein in the CLS case focusing on the unconstitutional conditions. I'm going to make a global point here and invite uh, a comment a point that will probably come up this afternoon in the uh, natural rights uh, debate, uh, namely that, as, as Kerry uh, almost suggested, the expansion of government is where we get into so much of this problem, rules of uh, uh, general applicability, as in the peyote uh, uh, restriction, which is what came up in Smith, as in the demise of private and public under laws that prohibit private discrimination, which is what came up in CLS. It seems to me that when you go down this road and you extinguish rights and create new rights, then you're going to get these interminable problems and you have to distinguish the Boy Scout case from the JC's case. And it seems to me that uh, this is uh, an invitation to, lit to employ full employment for lawyers when you uh, have so much law that creates all these uh, conflicts. Mike? Thank you for your comment. Response? Well, who's not against more employment for lawyers? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, we're going to go to the next mic on the right. Spencer My right, your left. Spencer Churchill from Harvard Law School. Mike Keep your voice up, please. Court needs to hear you. Spencer Churchill from Harvard Law School. Good My man. question is for Judge McConnell. Um, <laughs> in light of your work on the ACLU's case against uh, Tarek Ibn Ziyad Academy. I was interested if you could respond to Professor Marshall's questions about uh, the feasibility of defining religion. Uh, I'm sorry, in light of my work in which case? The ACLU's case against uh, the charter school in Minnesota. Oh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, uh, first of all, hello, Spencer. Uh, Spencer and I go to the same church in Palo Alto, so it's good to see you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think one of the, one of the things that, that makes our system different from European and international norms uh, is that we have both an establishment clause 
and a free exercise clause. And I think this is, this is a, a fantastic thing. A lot of people think, well, the Establishment Clause is sort of anti-religion, and the free exercise clause is not properly understood. And, 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 and for the definition of religion, the, imp the important thing is that we have to get a definition that works for both clauses, right? And so we, we, we can't say, for example, as a British court said, that environmentalism is a religion because if it were, the Environmental Protection Agency would be a violation, would be our, our established <laughs> right. and, um, and I, and I and I think this is very good, and I think, I do believe, this is a very hard question, and uh, there are probably be more articles written about this than anything else in the religion clauses, but I think the only way to make sense of both clauses with a single definition of religion is, um, uh, is to have a fairly uh, narrow and traditional one, and, and I'm willing to go with, with, the, with George Mason's in the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which is, which was uh, then quoted by Madison and uh, seems to be the closest thing to what they meant. And they defined, it, defined religion as the duty we owe to our creator and the manner of discharging it. Uh, and, and that is about as close as we can come. Now, the ACLU case you're referring to, I'm, I don't think it had much to do with the definition of religion. I was defending, I was in a, in a group of intervening Muslim parents uh, who were defending a charter school uh, in, in Minneapolis that did such things as allow a five minute break so that they would be able to have their pri prayers at the appropriate uh, moment uh, that would have uh, uh, food served in the cafeteria which was not, which the kids would actually be able to eat. There was no training, there was no religious education in the school. Uh, there was no, uh, it, all they did was accommodate the, uh, the uh, five distinct religious practices that make it very difficult for Muslim kids to, uh, to be able to operate under, you know, sort of ordinary uh, Protestant school circumstances. And uh, uh, to my uh, 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 regret, uh, uh, we didn't prevail. Next question over there. Right. Brian Bishop from the uh, Stephen Hopkins Center for Civil Rights in Rhode Island. And I wanted to ask my statesman, uh, uh, fellow statesmen, you seem uh, to, to express a possible concern if CLS was prevented from leafleting on campus, but how can you distinguish that in anything but degree from the sense that they can't be in classrooms? It's still essentially a state educational institution property, and I mean, it, the kind of prune yard uh, provisions and the uh, questions of distinction I don't think are, are uh, enlightened by the case. Yeah. Okay. I'm the fellow statesman. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think I think that's a, a good, a fair question. In the case, uh, a series of things are bundled together, I guess, and what the court really is focused on uh, are two things. I think one is the subsidy uh, that comes with recognition as an official student organization, and because that's really the question, the bundle comes together. Uh, and so I've focused, like the court, on the subsidy issue, which I think was rightly decided. I've also focused on the email list issue. I mean, if it was the uh, kind of world, and you can imagine a, uh, a different world of the internet where the only way to get access to fellow students was through the internet, uh, controlled by this listserv, then I might be sympathetic to, to that point, but it's not. I mean, we, anybody who uses email knows that one listserv is just a listserv, and there are lots of other ways to get access. Uh, imagine that the case was relitigated. I gave the hypothetical that I was sympathetic to, where if they were banned from campus um, uh, or banned from leafleting, where that, that looks like a different case. I think a, a harder case, uh, a hard case, too, would be one that focused only on the classroom issue. Uh, but you can imagine, I mean, I think that the school would be within it. Yeah, I, I think it's a hard case. I mean, there, the question is whether there are alternatives available to the official classroom, or there are other places to meet near campus or otherwise. Uh, but what I wouldn't want to suggest, which I, I, I worry that uh, going in the direction too far of the dissent, is that the denial of official <coughs> status, official recognition of, of the status, means there are no alternative means available. The best argument on your side are instances where there's just no other way to get the message out. But I don't think that a right to free speech is a right to a subsidy. Uh, and I think that's a, a point that should resonate with a lot of the people here. 
it, it is a right to, to, not, to not have your freedom of speech abridged. And in Bob Jones, for instance, I don't think the denial of the status abridged the right at all. It, it continues alongside. So we, Back I don't to the be, center. You know, Back to the thanks. center for Steve, one more question. Steve Calabresi, Northwestern Law School. Uh, my question is for Philip. Uh, Philip, you've uh, written some powerful originalist uh, scholarship criticizing as an original matter the incorporation of the Bill of Rights through the 14th Amendment. I wonder what you think of as of the original, uh, correct originalist disposition of CLS against Martinez. And in particular, the 14th Amendment as part of its core original meaning, as I think you've argued, bans discrimination and class-based systems of law. Isn't what was going on in CLS against Martinez effectively a form of government discrimination on the basis of religion, and is it there therefore uh, an element of class-based uh, lawmaking at issue such that the court got the CLS against Martinez case wrong? Right. Yeah, so thank you. I, I, I confess I'm probably one of those very rare people in this room who are actually is skeptical about incorporation. Uh, in fact, incorporation of the Bill of Rights seems to have risen not in 1868, but rather later, th largely through anti-Catholicism, through the activity of nativists, who had a vision of an American Bill of Rights, which flattened out all the distinctions between state and federal uh, bills of rights. Um, I, I think your suggestion about discrimination is an interesting one. Interesting one. And of course, there are, all, there are all sorts of state constitutional law issues here that I think get suppressed when we litigate these, matter, these things as federal matters. Um, Actually, I can't help thinking that what's really central here is the doctrine of unconstitutional conditions, whether at the state or at the federal level. Um, this has become an excuse for all sorts of restrictions that seem to me grossly unconstitutional, even when they have the force of law behind them. And let me explain what I mean by this. Uh, many conditions, although the condition itself is not binding as law, are backed by the force of law in as much as the government, at the very least, the ones that, conditions that run to the future, allow the government to come back and claim its money if you violate the condition. And even where the government does not reclaim its money, it has the power to do so, and that is the force of law. So many conditions are backed by the force of law. And then when it comes to the question, the central question is, well, can consent excuse this? Can consent justify an un otherwise unconstitutional restriction? And at least where the restriction violates a constitutional right or the separation of powers, uh, it seems difficult to understand how private consent can enlarge federal power. If a restriction in a condition um, is backed by the force of law in the sense that the government can go to a court and recover the money, how can consent enlarge the government's power, give it the right to violate any of one's First Amendment rights, or any, for that, at the state level, any of one's state rights. So it seems to me we have to reconsider unconstitutional conditions, and if one final sales pitch, therefore, um, I, I can enlighten you on this in the Virginia Law Review if you wish. Thanks. Well, I've been given the high sign, uh, which I ordinarily ignore, because uh, when you're a district court judge, you are the high sign. Uh, <laughs> But I will leave you, before we thank our panels, with this, with this observation. We have uh, hinted at and wrestled with the definition of religion. Is religion different from speech? I think it is something that will continue to uh, bedevil us and employ lawyers and uh, lead to many decisions. I would just point out, we've heard a lot about Yale law professors. I'll just make a comment about a Harvard law professor. We'll just call him Lawrence Tribe. who. Uh, <laughs> Uh, was teaching a number of years ago, a group of students, uh, and uh, uh, was uh, asked about uh, the definition of uh, obscenity. And he said that he had occasion to ask a certain Supreme Court justice whether he had, in fact, ever seen obscenity. <laughs> According to Professor Tribe, the justice closed his eyes for a moment, smiled, opened them, and said, yes, just once, when I was in the Navy off the coast of Algiers. I don't know that we will ever get a definition of religion. I don't know that we will ever get a definition of obscenity. But I do know that you will never hear a more sophisticated and helpful panel discussion than you've heard today 
on this fundamental question. And I thank our panelists today. Thank you so much. It was fun. Thank you.